Welcome to the Switchblade Sisters Social Club, a true crime podcast where two sisters exploit their worst fears for your entertainment. You're welcome. I'm Dee. And I'm Rhonda, and together we are the Sake Sisters. For more information, check out our website at www.switchbladesisterssocialclub.com or find us on Instagram and Facebook at Switchblade Sisters Social Club. Thanks for listening. This is Switchblade Sister Social Club, where two sisters exploit their worst fears for your entertainment. My name is Dee, the elder, and this is my sister Rhonda, the younger. We are almost Irish twins. <laughs> we are one year and ten-ish months apart. Yep. Uh-huh. And um, we are a little bit sensitive today because we have injected our face with poisons <laughs> and uh, all sorts so shout out to lucy meads for her amazing injectables. Oh, the best esthetician she makes it as painless as possible so fucking hurts though Jesus. <laughs> anyone who's had botox in the forehead knows that those needles feel like they're going straight into your brain huh mm-hmm. but yeah. if you want to have some great botox or filler done Find Lucy Meads on Instagram at W4 Lashes and Aesthetics. Yeah, you have to live in the W4 area, but she's awesome. Um, we're going to get started. We're going to get stuck in because we've got a really exciting people's pulse today, haven't we? Yeah, we do. We do. We do. Well, we hope so. It's a little bit different than normal. Yeah. So, um, okay. So tell we'll... us the fucking story. Oh, all right. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So um, I am going to tell you. The story today, I'm just reaching for one of the books I read with regards to this. Um, it is the story of the deadly affair. Oh, okay. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So, should I get started? Um, yeah. yeah, one of the main books I read uh, was this one, uh, Nicholas Davies, Deadly Affair. The electrifying true story of a deadly love triangle. Oh my um, God. This has the makings of a good story. It has the makings of a great story. Um, it is a great story. Sorry. I know the ending. It is fucking good. But um, read some articles as well. Links in the show notes or whatever. But that was the main source. I love this series of books. I don't know what it, the series is called. Blake's True Crime Library. Because it's it's they're trashy like they're mm-hmm. true crime but they're written fucking trashy so, <laughs> like the hate you documentaries like snapped yes yeah. snapped when women kill yeah so i'm gonna start with the story of penny McAllister. Mm. penny she was born to norma and desmond squire who met while they were singing in the operatic society in bracknell oh so we're talking close to home well, yes, so she's, because uh, Bracknell's probably like 45 minutes drive from me, maybe a bit longer for you, um, sort of uh, west of London, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, so they started, she started her life, well, yeah, fairly local to us, right? Norma, her mum, uh, got married at age 18 to Desmond, and Penny also got married at 18. I can't... <laughs> Don't make any lasting decisions when you're 18. <laughs> I mean, I know idea. marriages are reversible. And like, for you, it's different because if you had married the person you were with when you were 18, it would still be Jim. Because Yeah, you've been but together. even so, I still waited 12 years. Yeah. <laughs> Just to make sure. <laughs> but like, if I think about, I mean, I'm single now, so I can't imagine myself with anyone that I've dated in the past. But like especially fucking married to the guy that I chose at 18 who mm. even was that whoever it was yeah you wouldn't want him now I mean to be fair I have no idea where they are now they might be great great human beings <laughs> I doubt it um so Penny grew up on army bases um because her dad worked in education so um so he she's lived in Gibraltar and Germany so like I felt like 
related because you know although we've lived in the UK since you were five and I was seven before that we moved around a lot we've always been at schools where even though we didn't move around our classmates or whatever friends were moving around so even though we were never army brats we kind of had a bit of that similar lifestyle right? right so whenever I hear about this it's like a lifestyle that I can relate to I feel mm. I don't know how you feel because you were obviously a little bit younger when we settled here but um yeah so she met Duncan McAllister um one day in a bar he looked her up and down and said not bad and walked away ew don't like him already like right off the bat you're like mm -hmm. it you mm -hmm. know I mean it's like how can you make a compliment the opposite of a compliment mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's that isn't it you just know the guy's not a gentleman right so like for me that would be red flag i'd probably still date them for six years after this but <laughs> that's just me <laughs> anyway. um so they got married soon after like i said when she was 18 um and then not soon after that along comes susan Susan was in the army herself. So Duncan was in the army, mm -hmm. um, her husband, uh, Penny's husband. And Susan was also in the army. Um, Susan gives, is like an only child with big tits, mm -hmm. which basically sums up her, not her personality, but her, her way of operating in the world, let's say, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I feel like there's a lot of sexism when describing Susan in that there's a lot of people commenting about how she used her tits or whatever. And like, I'm just looking at this book when it was first published in 1999. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a huge difference with how we talk about women. Mm -hmm. Completely. Now. I'm shocked now when I read a newspaper article and they still mention what the celebrity or whatever is wearing when they're, when they're a woman. Like they will always you know what? what they're wearing and how they look like, but not men. I obviously, it that bothers me less when it's like at an event or something like that and it's a celebrity or whatever mm -hmm. you know you kind of expect it when they're like a public persona in that way for entertainment purposes it fucking grosses me out when it's like when someone pops to the shop it's like well, yeah that's what fucking... i'm talking about exactly that's yeah. what i'm talking about yeah and, they don't it, do, and obviously I'm talking about the shit tabloids that do that yeah yeah but no but it's not just the shit tabloids is it up until recently it was like Every when it bothers me more is like when it's po female politicians. Mm. And if you ever have to wonder if something's a bit misogynistic or sexist, ask if they would ever describe a man in those terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would they ever comment, even in a positive way, about a man's shoes, for mm -hmm. example? Yeah, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I was thinking um, the other day? People always like tell me how lucky I am because Jim is a hands-on dad, and I always just think. I have never been described as a hands-on mother. And that's not because I'm not, because I fucking am. <laughs> you know, I'm the no, I know, the exactly. Time. But it's just the fact that it even sounds weird to say it, a hands-on mother, because you just expect that. But it's like we hold men to a different standard that we're, it takes very little for men to be impressive. And I know. And very like, little for women to not be, you know? You you see a man at the park with his kid and you... And people swoon like, oh, mm -hmm. and it's like, he's just fucking taking his kid to the park for mm -hmm. the fun bit. Mm -hmm. You don't know what else he's doing. Mm -hmm. And you don't look at the mums in the park and go, oh, what a good mum. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. Anyway, side note. Yeah. Little side note. So um, it's like, I will say, going back to, I think it was a Colin Pitchfork episode. Yes. Where we were talking about WPC. Remember Women Police Officer? And we were talking about how, if you need to know how ridiculous that sounds, like say something like male baker or yeah. male scientist mm -hmm. and then you realize oh yeah actually that does that does sound like unnecessary and mm -hmm. weird mm -hmm. um yeah. yeah so anyways I feel very conscious that like I'm pulling from research that has talked about Susan in a, I'm, I'm not defending her or her actions but a lot of the way that she's been described I think we need to be aware of the fact that it was through a 90s lens, which is different to how we look at things mm. today. But she was described as like kind of bratty, 
um, definitely using her sexuality. She was a virgin, apparently, until she was like 21. And when she met Duncan, who, surprise, surprise, she has a deadly affair with. But that she liked the male attention, played on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that she needed to be like the center of attention and that she was one of these personalities, and we all know people like this, who could either be, depending on their mood, the life and soul of the party or fucking nightmare, mm -hmm. you know? Like we all know people like that, right? Where you just don't know which one they're going to get. Mm. Um, so yeah, she was a virgin until she was 21 and she met Duncan um, but she was described as always like deliberately provocative. Mm -hmm. Um, we also know someone like, we all know someone like this as well, where it's like a lot of OTT, like over, overly sexualized jokes, mm -hmm. and joking, innuendos, that kind of I stuff. But that. like, yeah, they, it makes me cringe. Um, I think I filtered out most of those people as I got older because, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, we all know people like that. But again, I want to say this is, third party descriptions of her through a 90s lens um so she was in the ulster defense regiment um so she's like definitely very dedicated committed to work i can't imagine that's an easy job this isn't during the time of the troubles in northern ireland so a very um you know problematic like very difficult traumatic time full of conflict um but she had a couple of instances of accusing sar sergeants or superiors of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really find out very much information apart from about these accusations because nothing came of them. Like no one was convicted of anything, whatever. Um, and obviously it's a long time ago, um, you know, 20 plus years. So I couldn't find anything more than what I read in this book. And, you know, we always want to believe, as women, the accusers mm -hmm. of this sort of stuff. I can also very, very much imagine, because we know that there was institutional sexism and sexual harassment mm -hmm. in different army institutions until very recently. Like, was it deep, well, not deep throat, deep cut and all sorts, mm -hmm. you know, people killing themselves as a result of it, all sorts of stuff. So we know it happened and we know that <laughs> sexual harassment was very rife, like things that were acceptable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, you know, nowadays are just absolutely not okay. But at the time we're just so, like, I am mortified when I think of the things that we were just used to happening. To that we tolerated, politely even tolerated, especially at work, you know? At work, um, just going out for drink. Mm -hmm. The things mm -hmm. that guys used to think Mm -hmm. Some guys, I want to say, would think we're okay to do mm -hmm. the places they thought that it was acceptable to just come up and touch you. like, And even the doorman turning a blind eye, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you kicked off, you were normally the problem. Yeah. yeah. Like, well, this is the other thing. When women kicked off, we were called crazy, you know, like Britney Spears. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's such a fucking, it was so common to just such a lazy argument to just call women crazy whenever they raised a concern, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, or, you know, if you kicked off or talked back or fought back, mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, look at her. She can't handle her drink or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. it, just awful. And it's not perfect now, but it's definitely very different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, anyway, so I basically couldn't come to any personal conclusion about the validity of her accusations. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that no matter how much she flaunted her boobs, that doesn't give anyone the right to touch her, mm -hmm. feel like they have any kind of ownership over her or anything. So yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, no one believed her though, regardless of whether, you know, I don't know whether it was true or not, but no one believed her. Um, you know. And it made her incredibly unpopular. So um, they actually moved, in one case, the sergeant um, that she had made accusations against. He was demoted and moved away. But they actually had to move her as well because she faced so much recrimination from this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the one thing I will say, 
she sounds at best like silly at times mm -hmm. and naive as a 21 year old woman mm. is allowed to be she's not like fucking gonna be worldly wise at that age mm. but i feel like she if she, before she made these accusations she would have been aware of the fucking difficulties that it would cause her so i don't know why she would make them if they weren't mm. true because there would be literally no benefit Mm -hmm. for her apart from seeing someone who did something wrong it's seeking justice for that situation that's like the only benefit she would not benefit career-wise mm -hmm. friendship-wise and i feel like she would have been aware of that so mm -hmm. i don't know what she would gain from it if it from making it up you know mm -hmm. anyways enough on that um, so she had to move and she ended up moving to the Ulster Defence Headquarters, um, where she made yet another accusation against someone else. Um, but she would have been convinced to drop this accusation. So again, now she knows how much difficulty it will cause her bringing these accusations. I find it hard to believe that she would make it up. Mm. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to believe that she would have been harassed in those contexts. Yeah, exactly. And there would definitely, by a lot of men around her in this macho environment, have been people thinking, oh, she makes jokes about her boobs or whatever, so I'm entitled to mm. touch her, make similar mm -hmm. jokes back, whatever, you know? Um, which, FYI, you're not. So, um, Penny and Duncan moved to the Ulster unit as well, and they decided to set up a diving club. They had um, been married at this point a few years and really enjoyed going on holiday and learning how to dive together, like scuba diving, right? And, um, and so they moved, they decided to set up a diving club, and, um, and Duncan started doing diving for the army, like exploratory diving. Ah, fuck knows. Um, Penny hated du diving during the cold and in cold water. Like, she much preferred doing it in the Caribbean, understandably. <laughs> so, although she was involved in the club, she very rarely went diving when they went diving in, like, Northern Ireland, because mm -hmm. those are cold waters. Um, so she, she was doing a lot of the admin, a lot of the equipment stuff, blah, blah, blah. Like, she was stuck in. Um, Susan and a friend of hers joined the diving club and that's when Susan met Duncan and she made it very obvious right off the bat that she was interested in Duncan that she fancied him etc cetera, etc cetera. um that flirting from Susan's part became so obvious kind of to everyone but to Duncan as well so eventually I think he was driving her home one day he asked her do you intend for us to have an affair something mm -hmm. along those lines like a very weird way of formulating it um and she said yeah i would like to something along those lines so they started an affair which for the most part took place within his car mm. like proper teenage shit right like mm. we don't have a place to bone so we're going to car parks or whatever but it was incredibly risky at the time because remember this is like fucking Northern Ireland mm. during the Troubles, and there was lots of incidences. You remember, like they were um, kind of like with Palestine at the moment. Depending on where you are, what kind of car you have, what license plate you have, there were different ways of being able to tell whether someone was a Catholic or a Protestant, where mm. they where they stood in the political um, divide. And also if they're in like a British army car or whatever, mm -hmm. like lots of people were getting shot in their, in their cars, taxi companies, lots of taxi drivers, because people knew what taxi firms were Catholic or what ones were Protestant. So they were like an easy target. Crazy. So whenever they'd go and like fucking make out or have sex in a car park or a national reserve or wherever they used to go, they were like a massive risk of being targets. Can you imagine your affair being found out because you've been mm. fucking murdered? Oh, it's just awful. Um, Susan told you bratty, only child kind of personality um, would be openly rude to Penny. 
Mm-hmm. It's like, you're already fucking her husband. At least be civil to her face, you know? Um, and Penny sounds like one of those just genuinely nice people. Like, raised in love, you know, mm-hmm. a very loving family, very kind, nurturing, caring person. Um, and so she could obviously sense that Susan was being really, really rude to her. And so she was just like really, really nice to her back, mm. which takes so much, um, so much dignity and mm-hmm. strength and whatever, you know, cause I know when someone's shitty to me, I just want to be shitty right back. Mm. Anyway. Um, at the beginning, so Duncan, Duncan, who wrote some, wrote his own memoirs after this, um, he talks about how he really enjoyed dating two people. Because, like, him and Penny, it's not like they had a long-term marriage where they've, like, lost the love and... and how old was he at the time? I think that this is like, he was a few years older than Penny. I think he's like fucking mid to late 20s. Mm -hmm. So they're still in their, basically their honeymoon phase, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they weren't going out long before they got married. They're like traveling the world, going to the Caribbean, going diving or whatever. Uh, He was like in love with his wife. Mm -hmm. They were still having like super romantic relationship or whatever. I'm not saying they didn't have problems, obviously, but like, it's, we're not talking about an affair because they've been married for 20, 30 years and things have gone stale or whatever. So he's an so opportunist. He, so he's literally dating two people actively. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also said that dealing with Susan was like dating two people as well. So he's dating three people. Because Susan, you could either have the super sweet, nice, caring Susan or the psycho Susan who would flirt with other men in front of him to make him jealous and stuff like that, you know? Again, Mm -hmm. from Duncan's point of view, Duncan's words, right? Um, You would argue that she was single, and even though they're having an affair, she's allowed to flirt with other people, right? Mm. So one day they had a dive um, off the coast in Northern Ireland, and Duncan begged Penny to come, or they wouldn't have enough experienced divers to partner up with the lesser experienced divers. And then they would have to cancel. So even though Penny hated going um, diving in the cold water, she agreed. And then for some reason, Duncan, who was like the main leader of the club, decided to pair Susan and Penny. Mm -hmm. Because they're pairing up more experienced divers they always buddy up when they do the Mm -hmm. dive makes sense right and And why why were they diving i know this is like not relevant to the story but why are they diving is this just fun diving yeah like a hobby Mm -hmm. but also there were opportunities to go diving with the army Mm -hmm. okay so like i don't know looking for mines or looking Mm -hmm. at shipwrecks or whatever like yeah he did do diving for the army so yeah, they they pair up like a more experienced diver with a lesser experienced one, and for some reason he puts Susan and fucking Penny together, which like mm-hmm. you'd think he'd want to keep them apart as much as possible, but especially in a scenario where like their lives depend on each other. But anyway, um, Susan refuses to be paired with Penny, and like obviously she just doesn't fucking want to because it's her boyfriend's wife. Mm-hmm. Um, But she claims it's because she's never seen Penny dive before, so she doesn't trust her. It's, like, a bit rich, considering this woman has, like, set up the club, you know? Mm. Um, And it's just, like, another example of Susan being a bit of a dick to Penny, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So despite Susan constantly showing Duncan how unpredictable and, like, emotionally responsible responsive she is Duncan continues this affair with Susan maybe because of that maybe a big part of him I think at some point worries what she'll be like if he ever tried to end Mm -hmm. but like you would have thought if you're gonna have an affair you'd want to pick someone kind of not emotional (laughs) I know this this kind of has like fatal attraction vibes so um 
I'm also getting like real Shanna. Was it Shanna Golier? Mm, remember? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So this affair goes on for seven months, which is quite a long time because these people are like in each other's circle as well, you know. Um. And Susan's hatred for Penny was growing all the time. And she was um, she was also really, really worried because remember both Susan and Duncan are in the army. She was really worried that Duncan would get stationed somewhere else. Mm -hmm. She is in the Ulster division. So she is always going to be based in Northern Ireland with her regiment, probably. Well, probably. He is part of, I guess, the British army. So he could get fucking stationed anywhere in the world, you know? Um, and very unlikely to ever come back and be stationed back in Northern Ireland. So oh. she has this constant concern that he's going to get moved on. And obviously Penny would go with him as his wife. She would not. So um, Susan's friend, Annette, the one that she joined the diving club with originally, um, also noticed that Duncan started getting more and more off with Penny, his oh. wife. It's like... I don't know. I was going to say he should, he could be nicer to her, but like, could not have an affair. I don't know if it matters. I don't know. It's just like extra layer of like dickheadishness, isn't yeah. it? Because he's being ruder to Penny in front of other people as well. Mm. And in front of people, in front of his mistress, in front of people who at the very least notice that there's like an inappropriate flirtation between Susan mm -hmm. and Duncan. So it's just like, Oh, just cringy, cringy and gross, isn't it? Mm. Um, what's also sad is that, um, yeah, so he basically once told Penny not to wear her hair up. Um, he told her um, that he prefers her to wear it down, but like in a dickhead way, like, mm -hmm. oh, don't put your hair up. You look better with it down in front of everyone at the diving club, which I don't know. I just. It's shitty. And a decent person wouldn't do it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's not nice, is it? Um, Penny, Like, you know what, I think it's really nasty when you see people belittle their partner, first of all, at all. But there's something even, like, worse about it, I think, when it's in front of other people. Because not only are you being a dickhead to your partner, but you're also then humiliating them while doing it humiliating you know? them publicly but then add to that included in that circle is someone you're having an affair with mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just yeah it's just not very nice is it um apparently penny suspected something very early on um she never really liked susan like she'd had conversations with her mother about how she was uncomfortable around susan because susan was being a dick to her so mm -hmm. right off the bat she was like i don't know why this woman is being mean to me and then I guess seeing Duncan and, and Susan interacting more, she got like first suspicious that Susan obviously fancied her husband. She she was never in doubt of that. And Susan didn't hide that fact. Um, but then getting more and more suspicious that there was something going on with them. Right. Um, they had. I mean, some of this stuff is funny. If you don't think too much about what happens after, right? So they had a dive one time and Susan's pretended to suffer from the bends. Do you know what the bends are? Mm -mm. So when you're doing like scuba diving and stuff and deep sea diving, you have to be super careful about how quickly you come back up out of oh. the water because um, it's something to do with the oxygen levels, I think in your bloodstream or whatever, but basically oh. you could suffer from something called the bends. So you normally have to come up in stages mm -hmm to um to make sure you don't suffer from this um from the bends well what happens if you get that <sighs> let's have a little google hang on symptoms of the bends uh <laughs> difficulty urinating uh coughing up blood 
Oh, oh. Uh, blotchy rash, muscle weakness or paralysis. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Confusion, confusion, personality changes, bizarre behavior, staggering collapse, unconsciousness. So if you suffer from the bends, you have to get put into a decompression chamber. Oh, oh, God. Yeah, like it's it's super serious, right? And Duncan had obviously trained them a lot about the bends um, and always made sure that they followed this procedure to make sure no one suffered from it um, when they went on the dives. Um, but Susan obviously knows a lot about the bends from all of the training or whatever. So she starts saying she's got these different symptoms. I'm dizzy, I'm nauseous, whatever. So obviously he takes her to the hospital to make sure she doesn't have the bends. And so he spends all day with her in the hospital. He even goes and sits with her in this recompression chamber because you have to sit in this like chamber for like four hours. What does it do? It, I don't know. It, I don't oh, know. I'm so intrigued by it. Okay. Um, she went in there for two rounds of this and he stayed with her and even after the second round she's still complaining about like stiffness in her shoulder and all sorts the doctor couldn't explain like her shoulder pains and a bunch of other stuff um and it was only much much later that she admitted that she had hurt her shoulder in an injury on an assault course mm -hmm. so you know basically she kind of wanted attention did this thing to make him have to go and stay with her at the hospital all day. Which so is she like, is a liar. So we know she has lying tendencies at least. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. So, like, I, yeah, I did kind of defend her earlier, but I just, I want to make it clear what's fact in this and mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. is subjective opinion about third party people with possibly motives around her yeah. up until, but like, She's not a fucking angel. Mm -hmm. This story is called The Deadly Affair. Mm -hmm. um, Penny calls Susan out multiple times with Duncan, like says she's uncomfortable with Susan, how much attention Susan demands on Duncan. Like, you know, with this hospital situation, she was like, well, why did you have to go and spend all day with her? And he's saying like, because I'm, it's my diving club. So I kind of get that argument. You know, he feels responsible for her mm -hmm. and if she does have the bends or whatever. Um, but, you know, Penny, like, instantly was like, I can fucking spot these womenly games. Um, we've all known shysty behavior like this in the past, you know. Um, I always remember, I think I've talked about this story. Like, there's certain actions that women do that other women can spot as fucking shitty. But mm. if you say it out loud, especially to a boy, you sound they fucking... They don't get it. Yeah, and they yeah. don't get it. Yeah. Like, I remember... Do you remember who I went out with the guy called... Steven? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> why do I want to say Steven? And there was this woman who always openly admitted to fancying him like she had tried it on multiple times before me mm -hmm. and him and he got together and she was always interested in like this girl called ellie and in his defense because me and steven had been friends before we got together i had seen how he was with her and he was very clear that he wasn't interested or whatever but she kept on trying 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 mm -hmm. um and then we got together and she instantly although she was always fairly okay with me up until that point started being a fucking bitch to me mm -hmm. And I remember this one time where um, we were at the pub, the big group of people. I went to the bathroom. I'd been sitting next to Stephen. My boyfriend went to the um, bathroom and Ellie came and sat on one side of Stephen and then on the other side laid her handbag and her coat and everything. Do you know what I mean? Where I mm -hmm. had been sitting. Like basically just making it so that I couldn't get anywhere near him and her. Yeah, mar marking what, mar like, basically yeah. pissing around him, basically. <laughs> and so I remember I came back to the bathroom, from the bathroom, and I was like, and I knew it was her stuff, because, like, she'd moved. She was, like, kind of all over him or whatever, and I was like, oh, whose jacket and coat is this? Oh, and she, like, was refusing to acknowledge me, look at me, mm. answer me. And I was like, oh, all right, I'll just put him over here. And I moved him, like, to a table all the way on the other side of the pub. <laughs> so um, I sat next to 
my fucking boyfriend. So she had to get up and go and get her fucking stuff. Um, but yeah, like I knew that was her fucking shitty mm -hmm. little move mm -hmm. to try like to- Like a passive aggressive move, yeah. Tried to tell Stephen, oh, you know, she put her handbag there so that I couldn't sit there. <laughs> and he was like, just move the bag. And I was like, well, yeah, that's what I did. But like, she did it on purpose. And he was like, <laughs> you know, but we know, we yeah, know, we know, we know. <laughs> right. So Penny fucking knew. Okay. Mm -hmm. She might not. I don't know how much she suspected and we'll never know how much she knew about what was going on between her husband and Susan, but she fucking knew that this woman was trying to get as much attention from her husband as possible. Right. Um, Duncan did what Stephen did at the time. Defended the bitch. Mm -hmm. He defended Susan saying who would fake such a thing, who would do such a thing. You know who would do such a thing? A jealous psycho. Mm -hmm. Duncan is so stupid. I don't know. Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they're probably fucking married. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so it was soon after this hospital incident, right, that Penny started calling her mom and talking to her about this woman, Susan, coming between their marriage, right? So even though Penny may not have suspected her husband of cheating at this point, Susan was definitely causing issues in their marriage already. Mm -hmm. But Susan's plan, her faking of the bends, massively backfired. And this is the bit that I just find quite funny. Because she was told by the doctor that she now can't dive for at least four weeks. Oh. <laughs> and the reason why this is a problem, because like she could still go to the meetings and help with the equipment and this, that, and the other. But the reason why it's a problem is because they had... A trip planned to Ascension Island, which, where, let's have a look at where that is. Ascension Island is somewhere, um, St. Helena. You know, it's like fucking middle of the ocean, middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a 12-day dive booked at Ascension Island coming up. And if she couldn't dive for 12 weeks, she would miss that trip. Because, like, although she could come to their local group meetings and go on the dives and sit on the boats when they're in, like, Northern Ireland, you're not going to fucking fly out to Ascension Island mm. for 12 days if you can't dive. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was work-related as well. So, like, she just wouldn't be allowed to, you know? Um, yeah, so she's backfired. You know, it's backfired because she wanted to go on this trip. In her mind, it was a holiday with her love, right? Because mm -hmm. um, at this point, she is openly telling Duncan that she loves him. <laughs> and he is responding with things like, thanks. Just like, mm. um, eventually, he started responding to her saying that he loved her as well. Um, but he claims that he only was telling her that he loved her to kind of appease her that he didn't mean it, that there's different kinds of love. Again, he's probably still wants to get his willy wet, mm. but also scared what Susan's going to do if he doesn't mm -hmm. act exactly. Yeah. Well. So he wants the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, at this point, whenever Penny goes away for a weekend or whatever, like she went on a trip with a friend to Germany um, Susan would come and stay in their marital home, mm. um, which Duncan uh, talks about it being their first time in a bed together. Cause you remember most of their affair happens in the car, like driving home from like their dive meetings and their different dives, <sighs> which is just like, Oh, it just, it just feels like extra levels of insult. Mm -hmm. right? um, but it meant that they this weekend in particular um, even Duncan describes that it meant that they started developing more of an emotional attachment you know because it was kind of like girlfriend experience you know like mm -hmm. actually being like a normal couple going to bed together watching a movie together going to sleep together waking up together having breakfast you know um but this sort of extra emotional attachment actually scared Duncan a little bit. So 
during this weekend, he on the Sunday night, he tells Susan that they should go back to a platonic relationship mm -hmm. um, because he didn't want her getting hurt and he would never leave Penny for her. Um, Susan breaks down and cries, which a lot of guys are not comfortable with. Um, she begs him to continue the affair, so he relents and they continue the affair. <laughs> but it's like, he's trying to end it saying, I'm doing this for you. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want you to get hurt. Which, like, it's a dick move if if it's not true. And I don't mm. think it, like he wanted to end it for himself. Because if you say, like, I want to end it for your sake, and then she's like, no, but I'm fine with it, then it's easier. Uh, you know what I mean? It's hard to stand your ground. I don't know. Um... So the diving group are preparing for this Ascension Island trip, right? This big trip. Um, and Susan's still coming along to the meetings and everything. She's not allowed to dive for the minute, but it's like, you know, hit and miss whether she'll actually be allowed to go on the trip, whether she'll be ready after her incident with the Benz, which we know she faked. Um, so she goes to this diving lecture in preparation for this Ascension Island trip. Um, and she's so fucking rude to Penny at this lecture like she would even pretend that she didn't hear Penny when Penny would talk to her and everything um he, she was so rude to to Penny that Duncan actually called Susan after this like lecture workshop thing and told her off for being so rude um partly because he said like Penny hasn't done anything wrong why are you being mm. a dick to her and also saying, like, you're making it really fucking obvious. Like, this isn't the best way to hide our affair. Yeah, but at this point, Susan's probably not trying to hide it anymore, huh? No, no. I think... She has no reason to want to hide it. I think she very much would happily have had their marriage fall apart and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know... And be with him. So I don't think she cared about hiding the affair, making it, you know, downplaying things or whatever. Mm. And she was definitely a very emotive person. So she's very jealous of his relationship of, with Penny and therefore resents Penny and therefore hates Penny. And I don't think she could regulate her emotions in a way that she could be civil to someone that she mm. hated for so much. For so, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So the next thing that happens is that Susan then calls Penny to apologize, mm -hmm. which isn't the weirdest thing, right? Like they are in a diving club together. They are associates. So, <laughs> but what is weird is that she also invites Penny out for lunch together. Oh, okay. I'd be nervous at that point. <laughs> I mean, like just from everyone's point of view, why would you want this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but apparently that lunch was uneventful, mm -hmm. okay? But, like, you can imagine, Duncan must have been shitting himself. Penny must have been dreading it. Like, I imagine Penny being like, I don't want to do this, but mm -hmm. we got to, like, keep things sweet. Maybe it'll make things easier in the diving club. I imagine everyone's fucking awkward. Like, mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable for everyone in this club, their interactions and everything, you know? Um, so the Ascension Island dive comes around and last minute, Penny is not allowed to go because she is a spouse and not actually in the army because it was some kind of army project. They were going mm -hmm. to dive at a, at a, um, at a shipwreck or something. I don't remember. Um, and they, they only find out that Penny's not technically allowed to go when they've already flown to England to get the flight to Ascension Island. Like, they're getting an RAF flight from England to the island. So, um, in the end, there's a lot of back and forth and calling of superiors and whatever, and Duncan ends up paying £450 for her to have a seat on this flight to be able to join them. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this pissed Susan off no end because she, you know there was an opportunity for Duncan to be like oh sorry Penny guess you can't make it 
bye, see you later, and go and have a 12-day holiday with his mistress. Mm. Instead, he fought, 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 you know, to find a way to get Penny to join them. So, you know, obviously that that hurts Susan a lot. Um, so basically, almost the entire trip, she's off sulky, causing problems, having fucking attitude. And again, like, for these people, although it's kind of work-related, because they're there somehow, you know, for some work thing, you can imagine this group of divers being so fucking excited. Wouldn't you be fucking excited? Mm. They're like, on this, like, you know, amazing island, diving, which they all obviously love doing, in this new area, and this warm waters, and blah, blah, blah. And they've got this fucking sulky little brat every fucking day, whinging and... Oh, you'd be so annoyed, wouldn't you? Mm hmm Anyway. Um, so at one point, Duncan actually pulled her to the side and had a go at her. It was like, you need to fucking stop being a little shit. Basically. I want to know what her backstory is. Is this just a case of only child used to getting her way? Or is there more? Um, I think she had, judging... And again, very fucking misogynistic way of looking at this i get the impression that she kind of had an ugly duck sy syndrome um they talk about her not having the best figure but then eventually growing boobs mm -hmm. so and yes she was an only child and she her and her dad clearly had like a very close relationship so i think she was a little bit spoiled in some respects mm -hmm. um okay. and then just like seems to be like quite again a, a slightly naive personality who's not learned how to regulate her emotions or process them or handle them maturely mm -hmm. in some yeah um so basically after he pulled her to the side and told her off she started making more of an effort with the group and with penny and they even hung out a bit together which on this trip you could kind of understand like they're a group of people um, not that many females in this group that they would end up having to sort of spend some time together, mm -hmm. right? Just, But it just makes me cringe because it just sounds incredibly fucking uncomfortable. Um, on the way back home, Penny had to travel separately from everyone else because, um, because she wasn't allowed to use the sort of army transportation, blah, blah, blah. Um, so on the flight back, Duncan tried to use this sort of somewhat alone time with Susan to try to end the affair again. But Susan cried a lot. And so Duncan agreed to carry on the affair. Um, and then two weeks after they get back from this Ascension Island trip, guess what Susan tells Duncan? Oh, God. You know what's coming. Oh, God. Is she pregnant? Yep. She's pregnant! Oh, God. Um, Duncan, and again, this is a lot his own words in his memoirs, apparently made it very clear that they had several options. Um, abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, keep the baby like she keeps the baby and he has nothing to do with it she doesn't talk about who the father is nothing because it would damage his career mm -hmm. um because he's having an affair uh with a colleague etc cetera, etc cetera. um or she keeps the baby and says who the father is and he would have to accept that and he would take responsibility but he probably would struggle to help support her in any way or the child because he would lose his job, blah, blah, blah. So he, he was like, oh, I explained it very rationally that we had these three choices and that my preference was that she had an abortion, but obviously it was up to her. But it's like, how much choice are you giving a woman if you're like, I'll do whatever you want, but I'd rather you kill our unborn baby. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do you then say, okay, I want to keep it. Are you happy? Like, mm. oh, and again, this is a very different time. Northern Ireland, I don't even think that abortions were legal. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, obviously <laughs> they're having a lot of arguments about religion out there at the time. 
a very touchy subject mm -hmm. yeah with the added dimension of it being yeah a, a baby conceived in a in an affair that could damage one or both of their careers so um they supposedly decided together to get an abortion and Susan asked for a weekend away together. And I guess because he felt guilty because she was pregnant, going to have an abortion, et cetera, et cetera. So he took her with him when he went to this diving conference. Um, and they had a nice weekend away or whatever. But basically, soon after, she calls him and she says she's in hospital and she's had a miscarriage. Sorry, I should I mean all of these episodes should have trigger warnings. Um now yeah, I'm just gonna carry on. But yeah, she loses the baby. Um and that, you know, for anyone's thinking, oh well, she was gonna have an abortion anyways. Any one of these routes would have fucked with her head. And even if you're going to have an abortion, having a miscarriage before you have the chance to have an abortion, you're still going to get mm. fucked up by that, you know? Um, at this point, Penny starts getting hoax calls, like silent phone calls. And for our younger listeners who are like, but how do you even do that on a mobile? <laughs> Previously, you used to be able to call someone without the, your name popping up and whatever. So, like, she was getting all these hoax calls, silent phone calls, heavy breathing, blah, 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 blah right? Um, uh, do you remember back in the day, the heavy breathing hoax calls were so freaky? They really were. Mm -hmm. So we're currently in January. Sorry, I forgot to even give a date. I mean, I told you the book was published in 1999. Um, we're talking about 1991 at this point in time, right? So we're in January 1991. And Duncan learns that he is going to get moved to a post in Germany in June. So in like six months, he's going to move with Penny, his wife, to a new role in Germany. Obviously, this devastates Susan. It was one of her worst fears that he's going to get stationed somewhere else. He's not going to, she's not going to be able to see him anymore. Um, also, to add to that, she got, um, she was very ambitious in her career. And so she had applied to do a course that would um, enable her to promote, to get promoted in, in the army um, in Beaconsfield from April for three months. So we're talking January. In a couple of months, Susan's going to go away for three months. And then when she comes back, almost immediately after, or at some point, round about that time, he's going to be moved on. So they have very, very little time together. Um, Susan one day calls Duncan and tells him about this like remote forest that she found that she wants to take him to one day. Because remember, they're having to have their affair in like car parks, forests, sand dunes. I think they did all kinds of places. And it's called, I'm going to say this wrong because in Irishy. Drunkira Forest. Um, I should say that like Penny and uh Penny and Duncan have I think two dogs, and Susan has a dog as well. So that week, Susan calls Penny and asks her if she wants to go on a dog walk to this like remote forest, which doesn't sound that weird when you're talking about a dog walk, but you know. Um so a few hours later, Duncan gets told that Penny is dead and the other girl that she was with was also attacked. On that note, I'm going to take a break. Dun, dun, dun! Oh, it's a good story. Back from the break. Act two. Mm. The deadly affair. So we left you with uh, the juicy Duncan, bit. Duncan receiving a phone call to tell him that his wife was dead and the woman that she had been with at the time had been attacked as well. Um, what actually happened, surprise, surprise, mm. is that Susan had brought a butcher's knife with her 
on this dog walk to this remote forest, snuck up behind Penny and stabbed her in the neck. Then she stabbed herself in the leg and ripped her underpants to make it look like she had been sexually assaulted and attacked herself. Um, she then ran screaming, screaming to the car park where she knew that probably there would be people. Um, she threw the knife in the bushes and she ran to this car park screaming, help Penny, help Penny. Um, she was taken to a nearby house uh, by some people who were there in the car park and she was seen by the doctor and the police getting proper again uh, Shanna Golier. Is that her name? Shanna. You Liz remember Liz, yeah, Liz Shanna, Golier. Liz, yeah. Yeah. Liz Golier vibes. You remember when she mm -hmm, mm -hmm. shot herself in the leg, right? Um, she had a very uh, superficial wound to the thigh. Surprise, surprise. Um, but she had been seen by the doctor and the police. And at this point, Duncan is informed that his wife is dead. By coincidence, this is so sad, Penny's parents were actually due to arrive that night in um, in the area, in Northern Ireland, to visit Penny and Duncan. So Duncan actually went to the airport to pick them up. So he picked them up and informed them immediately at the airport that their daughter was dead oh Ooh, it's just so awful um duncan spent a lot of time comforting susan in the following hours and days um because at this point it was did he not think for a second it was her i don't know but like there's obviously a big difference between having a little like mm, could it be and voicing your concerns or whatever and mm. this is the complicating factor they decided they knew that there would be interviews with police about the attack on penny etc and on susan the attack on susan in quotation marks they decided to keep their affair secret during the investigation supposedly in respect of penny's memory mm -hmm. and it's like was it that or was it to protect your own reputations and your careers and so forth, right? Mm. Um, police asked Susan back to the forest to reconstruct the crime. Um, they were already suspicious because... Sorry about that. Um, they're already suspicious because her wound was so superficial and could have been self-inflicted and wasn't really lining up with this like horrendous attack that she supposedly had been the victim of. Um, Duncan, in the meantime, is obviously super concerned that the affair is going to come to, to light during the investigations. Um, and I have written in my notes here, it's weird that he doesn't suspect Susan yet. And I guess because it's also a massive leap thinking someone's a little bit emotionally unstable to someone could kill a person, right? But I don't know. I feel like we would jump to that conclusion pretty fast. Yeah. Um, eventually, he actually confesses the affair to the police in the hope that it could be kept under wraps. I think at this point he realizes it will inevitably come out, you know? People knew, like, people knew they were having mm -hmm. an affair, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, the minute the affair came to light to the police, they had extra ammo against Susan because now she's got motive um, and she was charged with the murder. Um, Duncan had to, oh, this is so awful for her parents, Duncan had to tell Penny's parents about the affair the day before the funeral because it was going to come out in the papers. So imagine learning mm. about this, you know? Um, and especially because the mum knew about Susan because Penny had been talking about how she was so uncomfortable with this woman and how she interacted with her husband. So you would just 
like she, you know she's going to be thinking like of the heartache and the pain and the suffering that her daughter had in those during this nine month affair right she clearly didn't know the full details but she obviously was struggling with a lot of things um around susan duncan felt according to his memoirs that the police at this point were also trying to implicate him in the murder like potentially he put what Susan up to it oh. yeah so that they could be together or so that he could be free or whatever um so susan eventually dropped the story of a male attacker completely because remember that was her initial story mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. For our Patreon viewers, we had a little break in between Act 1 and Act 2 of this episode so that Rhonda could put the kids to bed. And clearly I need to be fucking put to bed as well. Um, so she had originally, again, said that there was a male attacker who came along, killed Penny, tried to sexually assault her and stabbed her in the leg. Um, she eventually dropped this when it became less and less believable. But started saying that she just didn't remember. You know, no comment, don't remember. Um, on the 1st of June, 1992, 15 months after the murder, and about two years after the, the affair actually started, um, Susan Christie eventually pleads not, not guilty to the murder, but guilty to manslaughter. I don't mm -hmm. know what her justification was. Maybe that she'd had some mental health issues or some situation which caused her to blank out, whatever. But um, the jury ruled a majority verdict uh, guilty of manslaughter. Mm -hmm. Why not murder? Because if she brought a knife, presumably it was premeditated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know whether they thought extenuating circumstances, but... The judge viewed the circumstances of the murder unlikely to happen again so long, um, so no long sentence was needed. So basically, because there were a bunch of elements that led up to this murder, it, those circumstances were unlikely to happen again in Susan's life to where she would commit another murder. So she didn't need to be sentenced for very long. Hmm. I mean, I I feel like somebody who behaves like that could actually do it again. It's it, like I find it very believable she'll find herself in another yeah, toxic, yeah, unhealthy yeah. relationship mm -hmm. and feel threatened by another woman mm -hmm. and fucking kill them. Mm -hmm. Right? So she basically she got five years. She got sentenced to five years with the potential of being free in 18 months. Um, her, her sentence was actually increased after an appeal to nine years, mm -hmm. which still feels incredibly short yeah. for taking okay, somebody's manslaughter, life. but mm -hmm. killing someone. Um, And um, she was eventually released in December 1995 after serving five years. So she served five years in total. Duncan was dishonorably discharged from the army for the affair. Did they stay together after she confessed? No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. Um, I mean, he was trying to break up with her even before she mm -hmm. was a murderer. Well, a manslaughterer. Um, but what a fucking story. Mm. I'm still I'm shocked that it was manslaughter because how can you justify that when somebody has brought a knife uh, somebody has choreographed this gone out invited somebody out for a walk that they're not friends with that they have a history a public history of not getting along with a knife how can you paint that as manslaughter how can you justify that as manslaughter you I know, know but so where is she watch... now I don't know, but do you want to see some pictures? Yes. I couldn't even find pictures of her, you know? Uh, um, I always want a visual. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. So this is uh, us um, editing us. Um, 
this is an alternative cover to the book I showed you, which has got a picture. Sorry, um, because it's all 90s and stuff. I couldn't find. So who are find they? Penny. Who are they on the cover? Is that Duncan? Duncan and Penny. Oh, Penny. Look cute. at her. She's yeah. so cute. She's so mm -hmm. so cute. Um, and this is this was an article. Um, w this is Penny's brother. Um, and is that Penny? Yeah, and that's Penny oh, again. Like, how man. fucking stunning is she? Yeah. Everyone talked about how kind and loving and fun that she was. Duncan, Jesus. So, yeah, those are the photos I did find. Couldn't find one of yeah. Susan. Um, don't really want to look at her face anyway. No. Um, but, yeah, fuck You know what? This is one of those stories, isn't it, where you just being a good person, going about your business, and something awful happens you know yeah i don't like I mean, those kind of stories at all and she was just trying like i said i don't know how much she knew about the affair some people thought that she knew they were having an affair mm. in any case we know that this woman was after her husband mm -hmm. she knew that that susan was after her husband and susan was being a dick to her and it really and reminds me of that the the liz golia one where the yeah. guy is a fucking idiot and re partially responsible. Like, I know these are extreme stories that we're obviously talking on our, about on our true crime podcast, but yeah, there are a lot of times where it's like, um, not to victim blame, but like, also, are you a fucking idiot? Yeah. It's sometimes um, you just have to fucking say it that, you know, he's, he's not innocent, Duncan, you know, he's. Well, he's, it's like, Okay, you might have never in a million years thought that this was going to end in murder, but you must have known it wasn't going to fucking mm. end well. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so it's, it's like Penny just trying to make keep the peace with this woman who's kind of making her life really upsetting and difficult, mm. trying to go on a dog walk with her to smooth the relationship over a bit, whatever. She fucking gets murdered for it, like. No nice act goes on un goes uh, unpunished, right? I don't like, like this story at all. And and also when you see their picture, it makes you just even more sad. And I'm gonna bring up the picture again because I just want to say something. It's not about looks, but also how much is he punching? Yeah. He looks like a dick. Can you imagine that guy looking her up and down and being like, not mm -hmm. bad? I'm walking away. He claims in his memoirs later that he was just trying to play it cool because he was really nervous and intimidated by mm -hmm. how beautiful she was. But like, mm. uh, that's not but really an excuse to be a fucking memoirs. What What did he write in his memoirs? Did he at all redeem himself? I don't know because, like, basically that book kept on referring to it, and I was like, mm. oh, maybe I can get a copy of it. I try to read it, and I was like, you know what? It's gonna make me fucking nauseous mm -hmm. reading mm -hmm. that much from oh, like I just. Oh. so um yeah there you go that's the story i don't like i don't like that sad story i know all. i know poor fucking penny and her parents and her parents her brother um i think we need now palate cleanser people's pulse people's pulse people's pulse post post uh post editing d chuck it in now Pulse. and fade out and go tell us how this is different so okay so we normally have a funny story we ask we ask our listeners a question you know that usually has really funny answers but we decided to do something slightly different today which was an ask us anything and I didn't know how that was going to go down because at first I thought, is that a little conceited? Do people even want to know more about us? <laughs> you know, I'm also incredibly nervous about this one. Oh no, don't be. They're nice questions. Okay. All um, right, okay. Because I, but I um, thought also, like, I also thought, what the fuck have we not talked about? We talk about everything on here, right? We like, really do people talk even not know anything about us yet. Yeah, like, I, I, yeah, well, that's it. There's not an awful lot more to tell. So, um, and also before we start. I want to just say that we had the loveliest message from a new listener called Jane, and she is just lovely. And honestly, it's messages Hi, like her. So yeah, Jane's amazing. And it's messages like that that we get 
that just she's really... the one that wrote us like a, such a lovely review recently yeah, yeah. oh Jane yeah. honestly guys another call out please leave us a review we do love it it does make we, our week we like we show them to our parents our parents who do not understand podcasting anything do you know what when whenever I'm working on something my dad who I've spent an awful fucking do you know I realized in the last few weeks in the last like six weeks I've spent about four of them living with our yeah. dad <laughs> between so traveling to Palestine and like going and staying with them post recovery for my op it's been a lot and whenever he sees me working he always asks is this renumerated work <laughs> <laughs> meaning is it work that you're charging by the hour because I I work for you know as a consultant for charities and whatever or is it the waste of time podcasting work <laughs> is what he means <laughs> fair enough <laughs> I mean well what we pay to MailChimp pretty much wipes out any profits from yeah. this operation but it is really nice to be able to round the fucking table when we're with them, be able to share the reviews yeah. or in the WhatsApp group. So it's like, okay, we might not be charging our normal hourly rate for this work, but people like us. Yeah. Anyway. And the oh, lovely Jane. another thing, another thing, you know, our DMs have been populated in the last few weeks with message of messages of concern asking about your boobs. <laughs> We have Bill and Grant. Had, Bill we and Grant. Have, we've never had so many messages about any one topic as we have about your boobs. Everyone was so concerned for your well-being and the state of your new boobs. It was literally like when somebody has a baby. <laughs> you know, do you remember Isla said um because I had to have bandages on for about uh two and a half weeks and they came off on Friday. And I was like, I get to meet them because I hadn't at that point properly seen the new boobs because they were all bandaged up and it's getting a bit like depressed about being all fucking trussed up like a fucking sausage in a condom. And I was just so excited about them coming off. They were like manky. And Isla was like, it's like when you when you finally give birth and you get to meet the new baby you've been carrying around for months. And I was like, yes. It's exactly like and that. And you know what? I have to say, they are architecturally magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> as uh someone said to me recently the surgeon should be knighted <laughs> and i took that as a very high compliment so yeah um yeah okay so, so the boobs are great phil and grant are doing well they're so still Deanna, a little bit tender but... Deanna doesn't know the questions that we have had from our listeners so okay so mary asks where did your love of storytelling come from do you want me to go first or you? Because I've seen these questions and you might need thinking time. No, I can answer this one. Okay, right go, go, that, go. Because I remember we talked about this in episode yeah, we did. one. Yeah, we did. In that, like, I always used to tell you stories, remember? Like, yes. <laughs> as, as kids. Um, yeah, I, I, you used to like, you used to ask me for stories a lot of the time and I'd have to just make up random shit. Um, and sometimes... <laughs> all the time they're like why are you laughing so much are you thinking of <laughs> it's true it's a fucking ask you to tell me a story that's yeah. making me laugh <laughs> so um so yeah we've just always I've always just told you stories and you love a fucking gossip so you love telling stories as well about other people right. <laughs> Uh, no yeah I know drama in my own life but it's um when Mary asked that question I didn't ever think that we had a love of storytelling. Um, I think I've always just liked a good story. Do you know what I mean? I like a good story. So if I come across a good story, then I want to tell a good story. Let <laughs> me yeah. ask, let me ask this. Do you have a preference recording episodes where I tell you a story or where you tell me a story? Because I love both I like of them for you... different reasons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I like the excitement of telling you something that I find really shocking or interesting. But equally, you're good at telling a story. So I like to just fucking listen. <laughs> I'm, <nostalgic. laughs> I'm the same. I <laughs> like when when you respond, I won't say positively, because most of the time it's a negative reaction. But, you know, where when you have a reaction to, like, story I'm telling you, 
And then I do also like letting, sitting back and listening. Do you know what though? When you tell a story, I don't react much because I just want to hear the fucking story. Like I'm into the story. I don't want to interrupt. And like, yeah. I just want to hear the fucking story. Okay, so. Thanks, Mary. Mary. Thanks, Mary, for your question. There's more from Mary. There's more. So she says, have you ever unknowingly committed a crime or been caught up in something that could be criminal in the true crime sense of the word? Mary. I, I mean, have why very... Why are you us under the bus? <laughs> this is for public consumption. <laughs> you want no to shame. Okay, well, you... I would say that I very knowingly have committed very many crimes. <laughs> uh, used to love the drugs <laughs> um i still do but i'm too old my body does not respond well to them anymore <laughs> if i smoke weed i fall asleep instantly i eat everything in the house and fall asleep immediately so it's like <laughs> rock and roll motherfucker um i would say that work-wise there's been some gray areas that i've treaded in protest wise and demonstration wise mm -hmm. For good causes, civil disobedience. What are the crimes? Yeah. I mean, I mean, mine are all car the... related. Mine are all. Uh, oh, uh, fuck. I have to go to speed school. Again. Yeah. You know, I just got one of those the other day. And unknowingly, I did commit a crime on the fucking motorway where I was driving in a lane I shouldn't have. Apparently, there was like an X. You know, there's an X on the motor. So now I have three points or I have to go to speed school again for that. That was unknown. <laughs> I have recently got two letters in the post at the same time. So I have three points um, and have to go to school. Do you know what? It, it, it is a problem in our family because our dad gets these all the time too. And uh, like I, I was thinking the other day, like based on who our driving role models and influences yeah. were, it's it's a miracle we still have a fucking license, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we do have a problem with driving in our family or, or adhering to the driving rules because it seems to happen with some, you know, some sort of a frequency that the three of us get these letters. Um, also, I wouldn't like to be honest with my accountant about my QuickBooks account. <laughs> I was going to say, there's some financial. Uh, but the less I say about that publicly, the better. <laughs> So there you go. Unknowingly, unknowingly, Mary, we answered. I mean, unknowingly, we don't know about the ones we don't know about, but the ones we know about, there are many. <laughs> so, victimless crimes, though. Ish. Uh, like, there's not, like, individual victims. Yeah, there you go, yeah. yeah. So, uh, she says, I'm intrigued by what these boobs are doing. <laughs> Oh, I'll send you a picture, Mary. And okay, so then she says, how has being a true crime enthusiast affected your day-to-day -day life? So I would say it does nothing good for your anxiety. I've said that before. And like what I said this episode about how you could be going about your business, being a good person and shit happens to you. And that's, what you know, I've never been a risk taker. So I don't walk around alone at night. I only unlock my car when I get like my hand is on the handle but the scary thing is you can do all these, in all these cases that we've talked about, you can do all these safety measures and bad shit can still happen to you. Can I tell you something that's going to raise your anxiety no, instantly? No. Oh, God. My friend Helen mm -hmm. leaves all her doors open. Mm -hmm. Like her front door, you need a key to open it, but her back doors, you could just open them. Mm -hmm. Throughout the day. Mm -hmm already raises my anxiety yeah madness through the night That's she never madness. locks her back why, doors why 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 i i was like uh, i don't I understand her, this this is like playing with fire i told her as a as a fucking female and true crime podcaster this is raising my anxiety i even told her when you get murdered in your own bed i'll cover your case on the podcast uh you see that's the kind of risk i just don't see the point taking you know like i i live in a high security house with cameras locks fucking everywhere you know locks you can operate with your phone oh i don't understand people who don't take safety measures so yeah i would say it actually has done nothing good for our anxiety i'm definitely more anxious more scared for my kids it's not been good on that front 
I mean, I guess it's good to be aware of how to be even safer. Even though Steve Gaskin said the the fear outweighs the risk. <sighs> but it's but the fear is fucking there yeah, and it is yeah. real. The yeah. struggle is real. Um but yeah, we would have those anxieties whether we had the podcast or not. So yeah, I would say on my in, in terms of how it affects my day to day, um, I have to take daily head meds. And- <laughs> get Botox injections in my jaw to stop the teeth grinding because of stress and anxiety. Um, When I hear anyone described positively, I think like, you know, when you hear pillar of the community, you're like good husband or good Christian. I'm like murder. I'm definitely more suspicious of people. And I definitely am more hyper aware of nuances and, um like you know when the whole Russell Brand thing came out uh, like maybe a month or two ago and I remember having a conversation with somebody who said oh no but he's not a predator he's not you know this sort of macho kind of guy who does this sort of thing and I was like if you think that it's only men you know these sort of alpha males that do bad things you are deeply mistaken so yeah. yeah, because narcissists and manipulators, mm-hmm. they come in different forms. Yeah. Um, I do want to just say that I got um, in the break um, a notification that he's been taken into be questioned by the Metropolitan Police Good. today. Yeah. Good. So. so, yep. Okay, Coventry Karen says, if you could solve any unsolved crime, murder, mystery, missing person case, which one would it be? I don't John Benet an Ramsey. Oh, yeah. See, I was going to say, I don't have an answer for this one. But John, yeah, and me. John Bonet Ramsey, who um, I don't think will ever cover on the podcast. I might be mm. wrong because I've said that about other cases and no, you've covered them. Purely because it's it's so big, mm-hmm. it would need like a whole, I think, to do it justice, like multiple episodes. Yeah, but also but it's, it's been covered a lot and by mm-hmm. people in a better position to cover it that can give more of a like a different perspective or angle than that we can um mm. but that one i would fucking love i have my suspicions mm. but um i would love to know the fucking answer to that one um in terms of ones that we've covered natalie wood mm-hmm. i would love to see some justice for fucking natalie wood like what happened that night mm-hmm. um yeah what about you so oh, I don't have an answer for that one because to be honest, I haven't looked into unsolved cases because I don't. I we stay clear of them. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with many. You know, I think I think it's because again because of our anxiety, we and this has been studied. Like, why do women mm-hmm. like true crime or or get so invested in true crime and watch true crime documentaries listen to podcasts etc etc it's and i say women because it is largely Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um it's a higher percentage of women but why do people do that and it is linked to anxiety about the world and the state of the world and everything Mm -hmm. and that is why a lot of people prefer the solved cases because at least in that instance there's something awful that happened because the world is awful but it's it's been resolved and there's been justice and it's been tied up in a nice bow. Mm. And so, yeah, um, both of us prefer so. solved cases to the unsolved ones. We do. We have okay. covered a few unsolved ones, haven't we? Yeah. Natalie Wood. I can't think of yeah. any others. I know there's a few, but so, yeah. so John Bonet, John Bonet Ramsey, for those of you who don't know, she was like, oh, she was tiny. She was like six or something Or when she got murdered. Um, there's a lot of suspicion around the very the various different family members. Um, and there's so many elements about that family in the run-up to her murder and afterwards that are just so icky. Um, oh, I'll tell you another one. Madeline McCann. Mm, Fucking give me one. an answer to that one. I know. That's a big one. Yeah. That is a big one. So, yeah. And then yeah. also, obviously, every other unsolved case in the whole entire mm-hmm. universe. Yeah. So, Coventry Karen asks, if you could safely spend time with any criminal, alive or dead, which one would it be and why? And actually, this one I do have an answer for. And, like, I think my answer would be the Jonestown guy from the, what was his name? Jim Jones. Yeah, Jim Jones. Because 
he started off with reasonably good values. Because he was, he started his, um, we had an episode on cults, yeah. um, which I think is coming out in our next season break, uh, like a reissue of it. He he started his church in like the 60s and mm-hmm. it was based on the idea of like equality for the different yeah. races and the different yeah. sexes at a time where that was not like in segregation America. He mm-hmm. was he had a church that was open to all races. So, yeah, there was so much well, of it that sounded me. great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was based on good principles at the start. So I would want to know, did he have bad intentions right from the start? And he dressed it up as this, you know, really nice anti-racist, anti-sexist organization. Or why did he not? I mean, he was clearly charismatic, clearly smart. He could have used it really for good. And that's what I wonder. Why? How did it take such a fucking bad turn? He could have really been a change maker and done good. That's what I want to know is why use all that power and influence for bad. Yeah. You know, that's what I want to know um yeah did he always have bad intentions Mm. or did he get carried away and corrupt in the worst possible way exactly with yeah did it did it yeah exactly did the fame and adoration corrupt him along the way yeah Yeah. so that's my answer to, to that i you know i find that more interesting and complex than you know a serial killer i think so i'd be nervous to be put in a room with any of the cult leaders or anyone with narcissistic personality disorder because knowing me i'd probably fucking fall in love with them and marry them (laughs) so (laughs) i need to stay the fuck away um actually my instant reaction although it would be so fucking fascinating Mm -hmm. to like interview any one of these criminals because like part of the fascination is that they think so differently to Mm -hmm. how we can ever imagine thinking Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to say the answer is none of them because mm-hmm. I would, my initial reaction is like, I don't want to give him any fucking attention or mm-hmm. anything. So I know it's hypocritical <laughs> to talk about them. Um, but yeah, I just feel really uncomfortable. Like, you know, and I write about true crime as well and, and different publications or whatever. So this is batshit because I, I know that if I ever had the opportunity to interview with any one of these criminals, I should jump on it. But I think I would have to, I, I don't think I could. Mm-hmm. I don't think, the thought of sitting in a room with any of these people that we talk about. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't want it in your life. I, I would just, I would just, yeah, I would just struggle with it so much. I wouldn't know what to do with that emotion. Because you know mm-hmm. how I, I'm not very good at anger and rage. Mm-hmm. Um so I'd, I'd just probably fucking implode with confusion and upset. Yeah. So we have a, a nice, well, we've got one more question after this. But Susie, our dear friend Susie, who should be one of our co-hosts, says, if you could live at any time in history, when and where would you go? I think our answer is going to be the same. But you go first. I think our answers are going to be the same. Yeah, yeah. Like 60s? No. I don't know what my answer is, let alone your answer. My answer is I want to go back and be a kid in the 80s and go, I want to go back to the 80s when McDonald's... You want to go back and live our life again? Yeah, yeah, do you know, I really want the coziness and the nostalgia of the 80s where, you know, TVs were like box shaped, mobile phones didn't exist, and where McDonald's had playgrounds and Ronald McDonald and really good toys and where you used to climb up into the Hamburglar yeah like I have such good memories and where everyone's house was brown <laughs> you know the eight, if I could go back, yeah if I could go back and spend a day being a kid in the 80s that would be really nice then do you know what I remember yeah that's what I want when I, we lived I, in I Holland getting on our bike after school and just riding our bikes for fucking like tens of miles <laughs> do you know what i think we were the we are the millennials are the last generation that remember of last the old kids of, yeah. of, the, of the of the the old world the analog world before mobile phones and 
Like, I mean, I remember when we first got a computer in our house. Yeah. Yeah. Like, kids don't remember that anymore. They're yeah. just brought up with, like, and, and we hundreds got our... of tablets and computers yeah, and mean, laptops floating around. I didn't get a mobile phone. I was 13. Was... How, what, when we got a computer? When I got our computer, I was 13. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, like, I would... Like, nowadays, I remember when I was in the office once um in one of my jobs and and asking my boss like oh has someone been on my computer because it, it it feels like someone's been on my computer and she's like I'm really sorry my daughter came in after school and she used your computer to make her powerpoint presentation and she was like 11 at the time mm-hmm. and like I said we got our first computer when we were like 13 we were not making powerpoint presentations no, and this one was first powerpoint at uni <laughs> last year of uni <laughs> she was doing transitions and all sorts because i was yeah. like I'm gonna fucking look at this fucking powerpoint presentation steal the template anyway but yeah so do you know what i i would love to go back to the coziness of the 80s even just for the day not not do you know what i would say second runner up is the 90s but I think I'd just like to go back and yeah. But being a teen in the '90s was fucking hard. Like yeah. we just said about. I mean, yeah, we were exactly like right. when we think about it in hindsight, we were sexually assaulted oh, all the fucking time. Basis. Yeah, all the fucking on time. a weekly yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, and that's why I think the '80s, the innocence of the the '80s. I would yeah. love to go back. I would agree. In terms of like a whole new era that I, we haven't experienced in any capacity. Do you know what? I think kind of maybe like the 20s, the roaring 20s would mm-hmm. be quite fun. Um, Do you know what else, Dee? I'd like to go back to Saturday mornings, eating cereal in front of the TV with you, watching Gem and the Holograms and Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, like, those were good days. truly yeah. outrageous. Music's contagious. Yeah, like there was nothing. Gem is my good. name. No one else is the same. Maybe we can't afford the rights for this deal. <laughs> I think that I sang the maximum um, <laughs> that but we're allowed to. I remember being a kid eating cereal in front of the TV on a Saturday morning. Yeah, like fucking c- cereal with like loads of fucking sugar in because it was before. Like I uh, worried about fruit that loops, stuff. Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. Yeah. Um, Lucky Charms. Lucky Charms. Yeah, that's what I want to go back to. That for a day. Yeah, just watching cartoons. Yeah, playing with our guinea pigs. <laughs> and a black and white Game Boy. Yeah, and our Atari Lynx. Yeah, that's what I want. Cool. That's yeah. what I want, Susie. This has been nice to reminisce yeah. over the good days. So I hear you've got a question from our favorite Sam because he's been yes, self hunting about it. Sam, my God. Oh, my God. We are. Do you know, why, do you know how I know this? Yeah. Because um, he messaged me apologizing for the question. He, I don't know what the question is, but he messaged to apologize for it. So, Oh, my God. On a scale of one to ten, how apologetic should he be for this question? Oh, no, it's not. It's it's. <laughs> hold on. Where is the question? Hold he on, said hold it's, on. Um, it's the question of a 13 year old lame child. OK, yeah, 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 yeah. So basically said now Sam you need to get to know us a little better with this question so he said have either of you ever peed in the pool <laughs> and I thought oh my god Sam this show we are so low brow is it is why you try to lower the tone more but I want to speak on your behalf D. D is too polite and too considerate to ever is in a pool that other people have to be in. Deanna's it's my phobia. Yeah, Deanna's way too polite. She won't even, she hates going in like kids' pools because of that, let alone she does not want to be simmering in her own urine. And B, I have actual fucking diagnosed OCD. <laughs> so I like hate the idea of other people's pee in a pool. I also hate the idea of mine. <laughs> so all of it just this yeah. <laughs> also, I would say that both of us have very shy bladders. Yeah. In that we, I would never be able to pee with other people around. Uh huh. Like I was talking to you today about when. Oh, I'm that being said, on the side of the motorway, I got no problem with that because if you have to go, you have to go in a fucking must... pool. No, I don't want to. I mean, <laughs> Sam, you know about all the things that gross me out. Do you not think that this would gross us out? <laughs> And then on top of that, like, do you remember, I, I like, 
it, for me, it's a, it's a proper phobia. Like I have mm-hmm. been on yeah, fucking years. holidays where I've not stepped in yeah. the pool because for years, I. You've always because yeah. you said kids. I know the fucking adults are pissing too. Oh. Like I am looking. This is when the I'm, reason I can't put my head under the water in a pool. I yeah. will not put my head under water in a pool because you are basically putting your head in other people's pee. If I'm on a beach holiday, like if I'm on a, a poolside, I'm watching fucking everyone in the water calculating how long they've been in there Mm -hmm. what they're fucking drinking how Mm -hmm. has that child been in that water for three hours without getting out to go to the toilet he's pissed and you know what i blame i remember when we were on holiday in malta this is the stemming of this is the Mm. like the origin of my phobia yeah remember we went on holiday in malta i think i must have been like 13 no it wasn't malta no it was like menorca or whatever anyways i think i was like 11 or something and there was a girl, I remember her name was Samantha. And, you know, when you oh. go on these holidays and you meet like a group of friends and you hang out all week or whatever. And we were in the pool and she told me, I'm peeing. And she's standing right next to me. And I remember mm-hmm. it was like it being in one of those nightmares, you know, where you're well. trying to like run or swim <laughs> and you're like stuck in mud. I'm like <laughs> desperately trying to get the fuck out of the pool. Oh. And from that moment on, I'm just yeah. like, everyone's peeing in every pool. And then I remember being on holiday for a friend's wedding in Mallorca, um, like in my adult life, in my mid thirties. And I was like, right, I need to fucking get over this because like literally I've been on whole holidays where I've not gotten in the pool because I'm like, there's too many kids. There's too many people. They're all urinating. I'm not, oh, uh, uh, it's, it's chlorine disinfects it. I don't want to swim in disinfected urine mm-hmm. either, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, like when people tell me the oven burns off all the germs. I know. I still don't want to eat food other people touch. <laughs> so um, I remember being on this holiday being like, this is the holiday I'm going to fucking overcome my phobia because mm-hmm. my friends were getting married. So we were all stuck in this fucking all-inclusive resort during the height of summer holidays. So it's full of kids. And I was like, there's no way I've spent a ridiculous amount of money to be in the shit hotel, but with a fairly nice pool. And I don't get in the pool once because it's full of kids. I was literally about to dip my toe in the pool to try to mm-hmm. overcome my phobia when suddenly one of the kids in our group, like one of the wedding guests' kids, starts crying because he's done his shit in the pool. Mm. And I was like, great, thanks. New phobia. New okay. phobia. So, uh, yeah, no. So Sam, does that answer the question? <laughs> I literally do not have a living memory of peeing in a pool. Yes. I'm sure it happened when I was a small child. Um <laughs> It's definitely not happened since I was 11. Oh my God, look, we have done a lot of silly things. <laughs> we don't piss in pools. The Safke sisters, categorically. Do not, do not pee in pools. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Sam, because that question does make me laugh. <laughs> yeah. Work harder next time, though. <laughs> you should so... know this about us by now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of gross oh, shit. She has another really nice question from Lucy B. Lucy she, B. Lucy B said. Lucy B said, "Hold on." Oh fuck! Lucy B said, "Why are you so goddamn cute?" <laughs> I don't know who it was directed to. Wait, Lucy but... B. Why are you so damn cute? <laughs> <laughs> also, lots of work on our face and bodies. Yeah. And filters. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, 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 yeah. Me more on the face, you more on the body. <laughs> We're becoming like death becomes her. I hope so. Mm. Do you know who I absolutely fucking love is Isabella Rossellini yeah. in Death Becomes Her. Mm-hmm. If there's mm-hmm. a style icon to look up to and want to be, I hope I'm her when I grow up, when I get to be 634 years old, however old she was. 73. I like the question. I love it. We should definitely do an Ask Me Anything every few episodes or however many episodes. You know, I honestly, I didn't know how it was going to go down because really, honestly, truthfully, we do tell you everything about our lives. So I really didn't know what else we had. (laughs) I have a question for you. Oh. Based on that, because like, Okay, we, we're pretty open. Mm. There's loads our listeners don't know about because we basically have between us like almost 80 years of life experience that we just haven't fit into the podcast episodes yet. Is there any topic that you would feel uncomfortable talking about 
on this podcast about our personal lives. No. Our sex uh, lives. Oh God. I mean, you know how I am about so I'm prude when it comes to talking about stuff like that. Yeah. Just because I don't want to know about other people's sex lives. People start talking to me about that. I'm like, no, I instantly get a visual. No, I mean, no. I, mean, I think that's pretty much it though. Yeah, because you know, we've talked about our partners. I talk about the kids. We talk about our work. We talk about our parents. <laughs> Do you know what? We talk about them less if they actually fucking listen to this podcast. So it's their own fault. <laughs> Even though he's embargoed us, our dad, from talking about it on the podcast. It was after we said he likes to take a freebie from the hotel. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because um, remember, I did. Um, so I always send Rhonda when I make the teasers for each episode. And then I right. send them to Rhonda right. via WhatsApp um, so that she could share them on our socials, or whatever. And I was drunk or half asleep or whatever and I accidentally sent the teasers fully branded and everything to our uh family whatsapp group so me and Rhonda and my our parents and this one unfortunately was the one talking about how my dad loves the freebie and a bargain and is always trying to save oh, money oh yeah and rinses out the airport airplane bars and whatever and so I had to try to pretend I wonder if you believed us I tried mm-hmm. to pretend that oh I was just sending her um, the clips that I removed from this week's episode. <laughs> oh my God, it's funny, isn't it? Oh, we still have to like explain ourselves because today I got a text from our mothers. Oh yeah, so yeah, we, we we mentioned how we had our Botox done today and stuff. I had a text from our mother saying, Che just told me that you had a visit from Dr. Lucene. Uh, what happened? <laughs> oh, and I could tell I... she, uh-huh. No, go on. And I could tell she thought it was like something bad. She actually thought that like we had a doctor visit. <laughs> and first of all, I thought, for fuck's sake, Che, why are you always going to throw me off the bus? <laughs> that kid is going to get I us. Know, and- oh my God, he's going to go tomorrow. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to tell his teachers that I had Botox. Um. Anyway, so I told her, yeah. don't worry, it's just Botox is fine. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Can I just say something that I'm super excited about? Yes. Um. The day this podcast episode comes out, in a few days time from recording um will be the day that i do my next event at the brewery market on church street in twickenham um so do follow brewery market on instagram amazing adorable bar on church street church street in itself is fucking cute little mm. cobblestone street just off twickenham high street that goes down to the river so cute and this is a bar owned by uh linda who's just amazing um who wanted to make like a a space a safe space where you can enjoy craft beers that's not like a laddie environment so if you're female if you're queer if you're trans if you're whatever it's a comfortable place to go and learn about different fucking kinds of local beers and further afield beers and whatever um and we've been doing a bunch of a series of events called murder on tap and we had one recently that was fucking so cool and so amazing and some of our listeners came along which was just some of our listeners came along from hours away Mm -hmm. which blew my mind fucking love you guys and um yeah so wednesday tonight the night of this episode coming out um it's the next one which is um bunch of cults about cults weirdly because we were just talking about the cult leaders and i'm just really excited it's just so much fun so do follow them follow us whatever if you're interested if you're in the area if you think you might like it because we do have a few more events planned um And it's just been amazing. So we basically have been pairing craft beers with different true crimes, different cults in this instance. Um, The links are tenuous. How we pair these beers with a true crime, because like, why the fuck would you? Uh, Because we want to. But it's just, uh, just an excuse to drink beer and listen to stories, really. So come along if you're in the area. And there might be tickets still available, but definitely do follow us and the brewery market because they they do awesome events anyways, and we do awesome events. Yeah, Yeah, do that. And make our day and leave us a review. Yes, please. Unless you have bad things to say, in (laughs) which case, well done you for getting to the end of today's episode, even (laughs) though you hate us. We're so fucking awful. And thank you, as always, for anyone who contributes to the People's Pulse, because I fucking love it. It's my favorite bit of the whole podcast. People's Pulse. All right. Well, um, as you can see, listeners, Patreon supporters, 
no one else. It's fucking dark where my sister is because it's nighttime. So we're going to clock off for the day from our Patreon. not our enumerated work. <laughs> this is the graveyard right behind me. See that brick wall? Right behind that is a massive graveyard. Yeah. And we have done some photo shoots in there. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> dickheadish, but we did. Um, all right. Love you, Rhonda. Love you. Love you, love you listeners. Love you. And see you next week. Bye. Bye. Hey there. Thanks for being a loyal listener. Do you need a new website or want to boost your social media performance? Or do you hate podcast editing? You've tried optimizing your website and social media channels, but you're still not getting the listeners, downloads, and engagement you want? We, the Safi sisters, love helping people with tasks that they hate. We know a thing or two about podcasts, websites, and social media, and we love working with other podcasters and business owners. So why not head over to SwitchbladeSistersSocialClub.com and go to our Work With Us section. We believe in collaboration over competition. A rising tide raises all ships. Bye!